Okay, guess what? We're live here on Think Tech. Oh, I'm Jay Fidel. Um, today we're doing, we're doing, what are we doing? We're doing life in the law. No, we're doing um, reformers, movers, and shakers. Okay, and uh, I guess it's my public calling. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so um, I'm going to be the Uber host, you know, and uh, in Sacramento, uh, we have our regular host for the show, um, Carl Campania, and he's going to actually host it. And our special guest, really special, thank you for some, coming down, Tim. That's Tim Vanderveer, he's the chair of the Democratic Party. Oh, thank fabulous. you for having me, yeah, Jay, fabulous. as always. Carl, silence your phone. <laughs> I've already silenced it, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was there. Okay, found... so we're going to talk about, you know, what? The election. What a good yes. thing to talk about on, on the ninth day of November uh, 2016, a day that remembers yesterday as a historical, for sure, historical day. I feel invigorated. So, Carl, you're yeah. the host. Take over. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Jay, so much. I appreciate helping facilitate this. Um, this is my first effort on, from a Skype uh, uh, hosting, so it's, it's going to be f some fun, I think. Uh, Tim, thank you again so much for, for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, yes, uh, you're, the, you're the new chair. Uh, you're not even there for a year at this point, uh, chair of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Um, it's an important conversation to have today. So, yes, uh, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start as I do. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is our Politics in Hawaii series, and I'm your regular host, Carl Campagna. So, again, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tim, uh, for joining the show. We're going to be talking today specifically about yesterday's election and the impacts from yesterday's election what it means for Hawaii. Everything from the presidential, I don't want to spend too much time on that one, but we do need to address that, specifically how that may impact Hawaii, what we may really have to be concerned about here in Hawaii from that presidential election. Follow that up with a brief follow-up with the mayoral race. Uh, we know what happened there. And then also, we do have some really interesting, uh, perhaps exciting, but historical news as well, as far as uh, our, our legislature is concerned, uh, with Stanley Chang overcoming Sam Slom in the Senate. So now we have a full Democrat Senate. So we're going to talk about that and see, well, really what that might mean as well. Um, and, and so there's, that's really what we're, where we're going to be, what we're going to talk about. So um, for starters, I would like to say, hey, Tim, let us know some of your thoughts. To, uh, I know you've been on Think Tech before. A lot of people have heard you speak recently, NPR, Think Tech, a number of areas. But give us a little bit of a background on you and, and where you are with uh, the party, and so what some of your thoughts are here in Hawaii. So I'm a, about a 16-year resident uh, of this island. Um, originally lived on the North Shore, although I live in Honolulu, in Kalihi Valley now, and I'm a third-year student at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Um, got some roots in the island. I'm a third-generation resident of Hawaii. My grandparents lived here. My mom grew up here for a time when my grandfather was stationed here in the Navy, and I'm a lifelong Democrat, though I grew up in the state of Texas, um, come from a long line of New Deal Democrats, a pretty progressive strain of the party uh, coming out of the Great Depression and uh, people whose lives were impacted greatly by um, the social contract that came out of the New Deal. And so um, having moved here and, and realized that this was a Democratic majority state, first time in my life that I had lived in one, um, I got involved, though not involved necessarily in uh, the internal workings of the party itself. Uh, my involvement was uh, primarily through my labor union starting off. I was a seven-year member of Local 5, uh, Unite Here, uh, as a worker up at Turtle Bay Resort on the North Shore. And as part of Local 5, uh, we did a lot of training, um, a lot of uh, education. They are an organizing union, so they do a lot uh, in educating their membership and putting a class analysis on um, situations uh, that you wouldn't otherwise think would involve um, situations with rich and poor and uh, the, the levers of power in our country, such as environmentalism. Um, but my first involvement um, with the party specifically was in 2008 as a delegate to our state convention. Um, I was then sent to Wisconsin by Local 5 as part of a team from Hawaii that was sent up to help out uh, the AO Favel CIO's change to win efforts in, a, in a Wisconsin. And at the time we landed in August uh, to organize on the ground, um, doing canvassing primarily, uh, McCain was up nine points. Uh, the day we left, the day after the election, Barack Obama had carried the state and had won the presidency. Um, uh, 
Apparently, we needed you there last night. <laughs> that's that's uh, that was one of the things that that I think came out of last night's uh, analysis. You know what what we're trying to make sense of today. That was one of the things that was mentioned was um, not paying enough attention to democratic bastions, um, places that are historically very progressive, such as Wisconsin. You know, the home of public unions, of AFSCME, of Fight and Bob La Follette. You know, of such a proud. Um, organized labor history, but not paying as much attention as we should have to the Rust Belt. That was a, that's a, I think as, a pretty well, stinging well critique. As, Michigan, as well as Michigan, very surprising, in Pennsylvania yeah. polls, and that's a whole other topic. But, yeah. um, but as far as Wisconsin, I mean, it, you mentioned that, but then take a look at you know, what, what has happened over the past eight years there with regards to the governor, yeah. with regards to Scott Walker. Yeah. There, uh, with, with regards to Paul Ryan, it's been a, a, there's been an uptick there in in what the Republicans have been doing in Wisconsin. So, is it really a surprise? No, not given the fact that the Koch brothers have been pouring such tremendous amounts of money into that state. It's not a surprise at all. They made it a priority. Uh, they poured a bunch of money into it, and they were able to uh, keep Scott Walker in power. And it was a, it was the devastating effect for the unions in that yeah. state. But if you, if you read books like What's the Matter with Kansas, you sort of start to understand how that, that narrative works for working people, how uh, organizations like the Koch brothers are able to go into places that are traditionally progressive, like Kansas, such a proud progressive history, and completely turn that state around using the culture wars, um, using um, divisive fear-based tactics, as we saw largely last night. And uh, it's, it's got a really bad effect. You've got folks voting against their self-interest. You've got poor people yeah. voting for less government and less social safety net, and it is devastating. So what we have is cognitive dissonance. Absolutely. You bet. And have an inability to reconnect. Exactly what you were saying. People voting against their best interests because they've been disconnected from that reality or from those possibilities from that new deal mentality they've been disconnected from it they've been it's been demonstrated to them perhaps or it's been just told to them over and over again or or has it just been tied to the cultural slash religious approach and has it been more has 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 the gop has the republican been able to build their base as a foundation of more of a religious visceral conservatism as opposed to economic? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, I think it's kind of all of the above. I think it's very complex, the reasons why they're able to co-opt primarily white working class voters um, into a cause that you wouldn't necessarily think, you wouldn't necessarily think um, would be something they should be voting for. Um, it's interesting to see the evangelical vote coalesce around Trump last night, though, especially given his history uh, I heard a really interesting interview this morning on NPR. I hope I can mention NPR Please do. on this show. I, I, Tim I, is I know, closely associated with I know NPR. Jay through uh, HPR days. Um, but it was an interesting interview with a Baptist uh, preacher from Texas who was defending Trump's actions um, in a way that I thought was just not, just not connecting the dots, you know? I mean, really giving him a pass on things like sexual assault and talking about how Christians can look past that um, to vote for a candidate who's anti-abortion, it, it just it just baffles it's interesting. the mind. His, his defense on that was um, just because somebody does sexual assault doesn't mean he wouldn't be a good president. And we know a lot of people who are evangelists who do sexual assault. That doesn't mean they're not good evangelists. It's hard to accept what he said. It, I don't get it. it. To, I just, to I me, that's the it. definition of, of cognitive dissonance. It's the definition of hypocrisy, which means it's based their decision process is based more in whatever part of the ideology is more important to them that they think that him as president will still be able to help them achieve their i guess uber goal yeah from that perspective and and so therefore we're going to sweep away everything else the fascinating part and it's been talked about by i don't know every pundit possible is how all of that has happened all of those discussions have happened he's had so much that's been brought up that, that has been negative, and yet it's been swept away. And you put any of that, any one of those things, onto any other traditional politician, candidate, it would have destroyed him. It would have been over. I agree. And I think there's, there's, there's that aspect working right now, but there was also this undercurrent. You had an outside populist candidate 
running against an insider establishment person who was Hillary Clinton, and people were ready for a change. And unfortunately, that change manifests itself in the form of Donald Trump, a billionaire who has nothing in common with working people, who could care less about governing, who could care less about policy, and I think, I think will probably run his presidency, his administration, much like he's run his businesses. I think he'll make Mike Pence his chief operating officer. And unfortunately, Mike Pence believes the stuff that he talks about. I don't think Donald Trump has the courage of his convictions, but I think Mike exactly. Pence That's believes the, the craziness well, that he espouses. Before we go into the break, Tim, let me ask you a question that's certainly sure. on my mind. Sure. Um, you know, it, it seems like from what you say and many others is that the people who voted for him uh, have been deceived. And when, when it gets, when, when it gets the, when rubber meets the road on this, they're going to find out that he's not at all what they expected. Yeah. And he wasn't worth supporting and he wasn't worth voting for. Yeah. Thomas Friedman yesterday in the New York Times had a phenomenal opinion piece. And what he said is we've had a lot of you know, controversy and contention over the past eight years of Obama where Congress wouldn't agree and we had the cliff and all those things. Um, now we are likely to have controversy that's worse. Mm -hmm. and for a while, for his administration. And so the question I, I put to you, as, as dealt with by Thomas Friedman, is can the republic handle this? This is very stressful to the country, to the Constitution. Are we going to be okay? We're going to be okay. Um, I believe, personally, we're going to be okay. I'm an optimist, though. And um, coming out of the optimism that was uh, the Barack Obama, the two terms of Barack Obama, uh, into what seems like a very dark time, what they called uh, looking into the abyss last night, I think, uh, on TV. Um, I think we're going to be fine. We, we've survived eight years of George W. Bush. Um, I think the world is as rattled as the United States is. Um, but, but, and that's one know, of the big differences there. I mean, uh, that's one of the big differences. The world is not certain right now. Yeah. And it's not, and it's, it's not just the difference between, well, yeah, we, we endured, we were able to make it through George W. Bush's eight years. Well, we didn't have the divisiveness. We didn't have the obstructionism. We didn't have the division of the country back then quite the way we have it now. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation last night where I pointed out, although I did not vote personally for George W. Bush, and though I really believe that there was a problem there with that election, Gore conceded, and I said, okay, you know what? That's fine now. Let's move forward. George W. Bush now becomes my president that I have to be behind as well. And if there's something I don't agree with, it's incumbent upon me to stand up and fight for it. That's exactly right. And, and, and to Jay's point as well, I believe we're going to be okay because I believe we're still going to be able to speak out. And I don't want to think about what happens if we're not able to the speak first out. The First Amendment will save us. That it, it may very well save us. And I think it's incumbent upon each and every one of us to not just be scared, but to do something about it and to stand up for what we believe in. We have to, we have to not just show folks that they were deceived. We have to engage them. And that's where we failed last night. We have to articulate where we're coming from, what we're all about as Democrats or as independents, what we believe in that is absolutely against Donald Trump. And we have to make sure that we're out there and, and out front and speaking out when, we, yeah, when something's well, wrong. The point in that the I... Chinese sense, these are interesting times. Yes, they we are. are yeah. in very interesting times, and that's why we take a short break. We'll be back. Okay. Right. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chang, and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Aloha, I'm Kaylee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. If you want to be an informed citizen, we invite you to watch every week as we bring wonderful guests together on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network every Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. We talk with people who know what they're talking about when it comes to the economy or the government or to building a better society. So we'll see you then on Ehana Kako, which means let's work together every Monday at 2 o'clock p.m on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.
fired <laughs> up, man. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fardell. This is Think Tech. Uh, movers, shakers, reformers, and I'm the Uber host sitting with Tim Vanderveer, the chair of the Democratic Party in this really interesting time in the Chinese sense following Election Day yesterday. And our host is in Sacramento. Uh, and that's Carl Campagna. Carl, take it over for the second part. Excellent. Thank you again, Jay. And thanks again, Tim, for joining us. Um, so, yeah, let me recap real quick what we were just talking about and, and, and put it into some issue context for a minute. And then we'll move on to more local stuff. That is really what this whole series is more about than just the national thing. So to begin with, what we now have is the GOP, the Republicans now control all three branches of government. So does that mean that obstructionism over the past eight years worked? That's, that's an important question. That's something to be considered. Um, will Donald Trump, President-elect Trump, fall in line with the full GOP agenda, or will his more liberal side come out? We don't know, and a lot of people are talking about that. What is that going to mean? And in the areas of concern, that includes health care. Well, they're already jumping for joy that they get to repeal Obamacare. Well, you know what? I heard Mitch McConnell talk about repealing Obamacare immediately. It's number one on the agenda. He didn't say replace. So what does that mean? <laughs> That's what funny, that funny he didn't mention that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we have the Supreme Court. There's going to be up to four seats that get to be appointed in the next four years. Now, we're talking about civil rights. We're talking about women's rights, abortion rights, equal pay, paid family leave, the LGBTQ rights, marriage equality, all of these things that we've been able to progress on could just disappear. They, they could just go away, possibly. And these are the real concerns. Uh, immigration, will there be deportations? Will there be a wall? I think that's ridiculous, but will there be deportations? People are scared. I have friends that I have seen on Facebook talk about, do I need to move? I am, I'm scared. I'm not sure as I go from one part of the country to another part of the country, should I be afraid because I'm brown? That's a real concern that people have now. What does it really mean? Foreign policy questions. Okay, well, how are we going to interact with Russia and China and Syria and Iran and North Korea? How are we going to do that? Will the war machine be kicked into high gear? Some people fear that this is going to now become, this is the precipice of World War III, maybe. Are we really going to see that? Uh, the economy concerns, the stock market. We already know the stock market went down and now uh, it's rebounded a little bit. Okay, what's, that, what's really going to happen? Trump expressed his plan to invest in infrastructure. Well, over the last eight years, at least, the GOP has declined to pay for that infrastructure. So what is that going to be? Are they now going to get in line behind him and do that? And what hypocrisy is going to be able to see, be seen if they do that? Has bullying, xenophobia, sexism, and racism all been emboldened now and given a voice and an outlet mm -hmm. and a means to express itself? Carl, These, don't, don't jump off Aloha Tower. Uh, let, me, well, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me just well, ask uh, one question to Tim that comes out of all of this. You know, we, we heard some terrible rhetoric from him during the last 18 months. Terrible. Yeah intolerable terrible yeah. but you know there's always the possibility that when he gets out of the contest when he's won the game now he can sit back and be more ref, you know re re reflective and thoughtful more reasonable mm -hmm. um, are you are you optimistic about that I'm not did? optimistic about that because I've seen him for long enough in many different contexts uh, to know better than that I mean he was a little circumspect last night but give it a couple of weeks and the same old Donald Trump will come out and uh, that's a bad thing for the country. But to Carl's point, as far as, um, I mean, I think that the top of that was being a party in opposition again, um, having lost the House, having lost the Senate, or, or still not in control of the Senate, and now the presidency, uh, what that looks like for the Democrats. I don't think obstructionism, I don't think this is obstructionism paying off. Um, it might have paid off in the sense that the, president, the presidency went to the Republican Party, but um, you saw what happened when Newt Gingrich and that Congress shut down the government the first time. Tremendous backlash. And I'm very hopeful that that will happen again in 2018. But the Democrats have a big job here. We need to make it clear to the American people and to our membership that government works, that we are the government, that the government has a fundamental role in people's lives. And if you try to shrink government, if you run for office with the purpose of shrinking government so small that you can drown it in a bathtub, as Grover Norquist said, you don't really have much of a role to play to help your friends and neighbors. There is no social safety net. And how do we look out for our old folks, right? 
Now we're talking about the Great Depression again. And so to me, it's, it's as much about us articulating our vision of what we want to see for the country as it is being a party in opposition. But being a party in opposition means you have to stand up and defend well, the things that we fought so long for. The courts is what I'm more concerned with, and I'd be interested to see what you have to say about that, Jay. About the courts? Yeah, oh, absolutely. The Supreme Court is going to swing all the way right now, and it's going to be yeah, a different kettle. And I'm very concerned about what Carl, Carl said, that we, all these rights that we have achieved, not only in the Obama administration, but for the last hundred years, are now all at risk in the Supreme Court. Absolutely, Republic. absolutely. So let, let's try to transition a little bit. So I, again, I, I thank you for that uh, uh, recap there, I guess. Um, let's try to transition. So one question from Hawaii perspective, and even we'll take this nationally real quick. One answer, one question or, or, or one word response. Tim, might Bernie Sanders have won last night? <laughs> yes. That's my, that's my personal opinion, not the opinion yep. of the party, but Bernie Sanders might have won last night. And I think something we talked about before this interview started, Carl, was the debate. I wouldn't call it a civil war, as I, th I think you characterize it as, but the, the debate within the Democratic Party. It's been going on for a very, very long time. And I was enthused coming out of convention uh, that we had set our differences aside and come out of that convention a stronger party. But the debate is basically between New Deal Democrats, the more progressive wing of the party, and the yeah. third way, which are the more centrist Democrats. Um, they each have their pros and cons, right? The New Deal saved our country from the depths of the Great Depression. The third way probably was the only party that could have come to power after the years of Reagan and the first Bush. Um, and, and it worked, actually. And there were some progressive things that came out of that. Um, but I think what we've seen tonight is uh, the future of the party um, largely being ignored and by and large young people broke for the more progressive New Deal style uh, politics the Democratic Party and that in my opinion is the future that we need to get engaged and get involved and make sure that those are the folks that are leading us into the future I, I agree because that's that's the next question where do we go from here and now that we have a at least a perceived void or, or, or power vacuum in in certainly at that level, okay, we have, to, we have to figure out who's going to be stepping up and who's going to stand up and what that's going to mean and how that is going to be, I guess, presented and, and by whom. So that's an important question that, that I know we're going to be finding out in the coming years. Um, but I want to say very quickly, Carl, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I do want to say, you know, while I can speculate about Bernie Sanders, it's important not only um, in, to engage the young people, it's also important for us as Democrats to come together. And that's what I had hoped we could do out of convention. Um, I, I certainly uh, got behind our candidate, Hillary Clinton. I thought she was by and far and away the best candidate um, in this race, and uh, it's who I voted for. Um, yeah. But we've got to come together as Democrats, no matter who the nominee is next time, in okay. a way that we're actually really get out there engaging the grassroots, because I don't know that that happened this time. It obviously didn't happen and, this and time. And at the, at the end of the election, all of the rhetoric and all of the emotions that happened around the convention and all of that, by the time we got to November 8th, we did. We coalesced. We came together. Jill Stein didn't get a big bump. Gary no. Johnson didn't get a big no. bump. Yeah, we Carl, but the, you know, the problem here is that just as the Republican Party was all splintered in the course of this, so was the Democratic Party. It and, was. And, you know, you alluded to it a minute ago, Tim, that the Democratic Party has some work to do. Oh, It has some bet. changes to make. You it bet. wants to reconnect with the people who are going to determine the next presidential election. What exactly. is that work? What is, has to happen? It's not only Hawaii. In fact, it's not Hawaii at all, because it's pretty together here on the mainland is a problem. Well, it's... But, it, but it's, in, it's in both, Sorry, go ahead, Carl. I'll say that's the next question, though. How does that election last night how does that national election last night impact hawaii where does it impact hawaii well as it as, as far as the democratic party um it starts at the top right we've got to reorganize the dnc we have to um we have to be able to give people a sense that the dnc is being above board and is fair and open in all of the business it conducts between especially between the candidates of our own party um, so we've got a clean house of the DNC, in my opinion, my humble so opinion, as a national, state that's party a, chair. But we are, we are in, in, in good stead here in, in our local party, yes. but we've got a lot of work to do yes. at the local level as well. Because by and large, what we can do in Hawaii, in reflecting our values, in sending a congressional delegation of Democrats to Washington, D.C., we're going to be able to help other states 
um, in doing so. And so we've got to be able to be strong enough here, especially by the next midterm, to be able to go out and adopt a state, if you will, or go out and help other states, some of the swing states. That's an interesting notion. And reinvigorate those Democrats there, remind them of their history. We've got such a proud history in this party, the Democratic Revolution of 54, which came straight out of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we need to, uh, to, to go, in my opinion. Carl, you, you really ought to take a few minutes now to talk about state elections. We only have yeah. three, four minutes left. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, real quick. Um, all right, so Mayor Oral, we know Kirk Caldwell won re-election. So that pretty much means what was happening before the election is going to continue happening. The questions that exist there, are, okay, great. Um, since it was, you know, was it actually closer than we thought it was going to be? Or was it further apart? Well, I don't know what the answer to that, and, and, and there's a lot of, of debate for those, but fine. But because it was as close as it was, does that show that the, the people's opinion on rail, and will that impact any of that? And the bigger question is, that's still hanging out there, we've got to build it, how are we going to pay for it? Those are the questions there. There's no answers there. I'm just running through this. Sure. Um, the housing and homelessness concerns are some of the other issues where we're going to continue the current policy and we're going to continue on with that and hope that all works. Um, some concerns from the Democratic Party, from the Republican Party, for the state of Hawaii is, okay, well, who are we looking for for 2020 for the mayor? Okay, these are things to be considered. Okay, fine. Now, the more interesting topic, more interesting because mayor is, we're going to get more of the same. As far as state Senate is concerned, it's now 25 to 0. Stanley Chang was able to win against Sam Slom. It's now 25 to 0 in the Senate. Mm -hmm. What real impact is that going to have? The House of Republicans are down one now because Sean Quinlan won. Yep, he, yep. He, uh, he overcame uh, Fecky Puha. Happy to hear that. Yeah. So, there, so now the House is down. It's now 45 to 6. And then we've heard all these rumors about the possibility of maybe they're going to lose one more. So that will be 46 to 5, maybe, if mm -hmm. that happens. Mm -hmm. My question is, Tim, from your perspective, and by all means, Jay, jump in on this. What does it really mean <laughs> for Hawaii? How important is that really? It's such a dominant, one-sided legislature. Is it really that? Are we really, does that really mean we're progressive? What does it really mean? What do you, re what do you think that this means now? Jay, take this one. Just kidding. Um, I do have some comments, but good. I'll wait, well, I'll wait I, I'm happy to hear them, actually. I, I, I'm, I'll make it very brief. I don't know, as far as brass tacks, that it, it really means that much in the Senate. You know, I think there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of time talking about what it means to lose uh, Stan Sloan, or Sam Sloan, rather. Um, you know, I, I think the people of East Hawaii deserved a progressive voice, and they got one last night in Stanley Chain. I'm very proud that he won that seat. He worked very, very hard in that district, and our coordinated campaign worked very hard uh, to help him win last night. Um, but Sam Sloan was one voice, um, albeit a very vocal minority, um, but he was one voice. And so as far as, you know, the actual day-to-day -day business of our Senate, I don't know that it matters that much. Same goes uh, for the House. I think oftentimes there's sort of a false equivalency. The, the Republican Party here is not on the same uh, stage as the Democratic Party. And so I don't think they should be given equal footing um, until they can get their own House in order and, and actually build a party. Um, I think it will be interesting, however, to, to highlight some of the differences between our Democrats because we do have a very diverse party, uh, which is a good thing. We can have that debate. I don't know that the Republican Party can have it. They, they were able to have it last night, evidently, and, and come to terms and elect a president. But I don't know, I don't know that it's that is, is, uh, is maybe earth-shattering as some folks say it is. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that it is. And, and I think that, yeah, I, 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 rather than me talk, yeah, Jake, what, do you, what, what have you got? What do you got to talk for there? Well, I, I, we, we're out of time, but let me just throw this thought at you. Um, you say the Democratic Party is inclusive, and it includes, you know, from one side of the spectrum to the other. I think the Democratic Party is sitting pretty. Mm -hmm. I think if the Republican Party ever got its act together, mm -hmm. they would knock off a lot of voters by simply taking a position that's not so left, that's a little more right. Not as right as the, you know, the Republican Party traditionally or on the mainland, but right for Hawaii. And I think things will change. Right now, it seems pretty bleak for the Republicans, and they argue with each other all the time, which is really silly. Um, but one of these days, Tim, watch out. Well, the last, the last question... So, same so, nationally, though. The Democrats are going to do the same thing nationally. So I put yeah. that right back at you, Jay. <laughs> okay. The, the, last, the last question to leave as, uh, for everyone... To We're out of time, so why don't you make a statement about what you no. wanted to discuss? Okay, well, yeah, the, all... all uh, the, the, it's not, a, it's not a question for, for anyone to answer right now, but it's, if that happens, if they stand up, but are we really as, 
I don't know, are we really as dominant? And I think that's part of what Tim was trying to say. We're not necessarily as dominant. And if the Republican Party got up, and if we actually tried to define and draw lines, we would realize that a number of our elected officials who call themselves Democrats really more align with the Republicans. And that's an important thing to understand. And is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? That's what I leave with, though. Well, that's so. one thing you have to say about this election and about this discussion. And that is, it has revitalized interest. I don't think we changed a lot on the, uh, you know, the, the voting percentages, although we did to some extent nationally. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that people are more aware, they're more thinking about this, they're more thinking about the kinds of issues you've been considering. Uh, and so maybe if I could find a bright side here, it's hard to find a bright side. Uh, maybe, maybe this country can be more Akamai about political issues going forward. Elections have consequences. Yeah. We got to organize. We yeah. got to.